Welcome to our informative video on free lateral lasers, or more commonly known as FELs. In this video, we'll be discussing the physics behind FELs, the technological considerations that go into applying these principles, as well as potential and current research using FELs. Before I hand you over to our physicist, however, I want to mention a little bit about what the motivation for FELs is. The purpose of science is finding out why and how things happen. When it comes to chemical reactions, it has become relatively easier to determine why they occur. And we are also getting better at predicting the mechanisms for how they occur. Theoretically, reaction mechanisms are given by curly arrows in chemistry, but practically, advancements in technology could allow us to record reactions in real time. Here, I show one of many artists' interpretations of a biological process on the molecular scale. But all these movies are just that, interpretations of predictions. However, if we can record a reaction on the molecular scale, then there would be no question as to the validity of the reaction mechanics. We are interested in visualising the dynamics of individual molecules, which can also help us better understand how they interact with each other. The main pull of retaining this information is to help us understand biological systems for medicine or material synthetic processes to optimise their efficiency. It is FELs which offer this potential, granted with a lot of work, as you will come to see. There are variations of FELs. In this video, we will be only considering X-ray FELs or XFELs, as they are being built at large sites across the globe and stand at the forefront of this endeavour. Additionally, if we want to look at chemical reactions, we need X-rays to do this, and we'll show you why. I pass you on now to our physicists to gain some insight into the physical laws involved in free electron lasers. Thank you, presenter Jess, for that absolutely wonderful introduction. Also, shout out to your camera person and the set designer. So, I'm the physicist and I'm going to talk about the physics behind a free electron laser. So, let's jump straight in by considering the wavelength regime of light that we want the free electron laser to emit. If you want to resolve two objects with a distance d between them, you need to use electromagnetic radiation with a wavelength on the order of or less than d, and that is called the diffraction limit. For images and videos of everyday objects, we can use radiation in the visible portion of the EM spectrum, as this involves distances and wavelengths on the order of hundreds of nanometers. As mentioned in the introduction, we want to uncover the dynamics of objects as small as molecules, however. So for this size of object, we are operating on a level of angstroms or 0.1 nanometers. And therefore, we need to use X-rays. And how do we actually obtain these molecular images or videos? So we do that by X-ray diffraction. So we've agreed upon the wavelength of radiation required, but there are also some other considerations that we should think about. So firstly, let's think a bit about the coherence of the radiation. Coherent radiation is absolutely fundamental for X-ray diffraction so that interference patterns can be formed. From these interference patterns in reciprocal space, we can then obtain an image of what we're actually trying to look at in real space. Furthermore, the intensity of coherent radiation scales as n squared, whereas the intensity of incoherent radiation only scales as n. Therefore, if we want to maximise the intensity, coherent radiation is essential. Coherence will be expanded upon more by our engineer um, when we are considering multiple sources of the electromagnetic radiation acting together. Now on to brilliance. What exactly is this and why is it important? Videos or movies are essentially made up of many still images captured in rapid succession. For everyday dynamics, a shutter speed of milli or microseconds is enough to keep up the speed at which a scene of interest unfolds. However, we want to shoot a molecular movie and molecules move very fast on a scale of femtoseconds, so the shutter speed needs to match that. For there to be enough light flooding this scene of interest when that, within that very short femtosecond time interval, the light is going to have to be extremely intense. In fact, there is a figure of merit that we use to describe this, and that is called the brilliance. And that takes into account the concentration of photons, both spatially and temporally. And as you can see from this expression, to maximise the brilliance of light, there needs to be many photons emitted per unit time in a very small solid angle. So how do we create such brilliant X-ray radiation? Well, we use accelerating electrons travelling at relativistic speeds. 
As you know, a stationary electron or any other charged particle gives rise to an electric field surrounding it. However, if we accelerate the electron, this actually gives rise to a time varying electric field and thus we have electromagnetic radiation. We can maybe make the electrons move in a sinusoidal path so that their velocity is constantly changing. We can take advantage of magnets and Fleming's left hand rule to obtain this sinusoidal electron motion. So why relativistic speeds? Well, accelerating electrons close to the speed of light means that the electromagnetic radiation that they are emitting is compressed into a very narrow cone perpendicular to the velocity. And that is called Lorentz contraction, which is a relativistic phenomenon. So we have a very focused beam of radiation, which is exactly what we want, because that means high brilliance. There we have it. We are able to create radiation in the X-ray regime that has a very high brilliance by accelerating electrons to relativistic speeds. How we obtain the coherence of this radiation will be explained by our engineer. Hi, I'm a real engineer working at a real X-ray free electron laser. Let me show you how it works. Your typical free electron laser has four main sections, the electron source, the accelerating phase, the radiation phase, and the experimental hall. Now you can't have a free electron laser without electrons, so let's start by taking a look at the source. Everything begins with an intense burst of UV light from a driving laser, seen in red, striking a copper plate, which in turn emits an incoherent bunch of electrons, which you can see in blue. These electrons are still quite slow, so they are guided into the linear accelerator, which consists of a series of devices called RF cavities. When cooled to 2 Kelvin, these devices can accelerate a bunch of electrons very close to the speed of light. The electron bunch then leaves the accelerating section with a constant velocity. That means no acceleration, which means no X-ray radiation. Not too worry. The electrons are about to enter the most important part of the free electron laser, the underlayer. Here, the electron bunch passes through a series of magnets with alternating polarity, north, south, north, south, and so on. As a result, the electrons experience a Lorentz force, perpendicular to their direction of travel. The electrons are basically forced into a slalom trajectory, moving side to side with the fixed wavelength and frequency, just like a sine wave. Because of the relativistic effects my colleague just discussed, these accelerating electrons will emit radiation in line with their direction of travel. If everything is tuned just right, the radiation will have a wavelength corresponding to X-ray light. But there's a problem. The electrons in the bunch are smeared out, each producing its own X-ray out of phase with its neighbors. In other words, the light is still incoherent, which is not at all what we want. Fortunately, Provided that the electrons are already quite close to each other, this problem will correct itself. In reality, each electron interacts with the waves produced by its neighbors, and through this complicated interaction, the electron bunch organizes itself into a series of smaller bunches or microbunches, where the electrons in each microbunch are in line with each other. Because they are practically in the same space, each peak that is emitted is in phase with its neighboring peak. So we end up with a series of waves which look exactly the same in time and space, and therefore can interfere constructively, which gives us a massive boost in intensity. In other words, the light is now coherent, just like light from a laser, and hence the name free electron laser. In fact, the intensity of light coming out of an FPL can be as much as 10 to the 25 times brighter than the first X-ray sources constructed 100 years ago. So we started with a slow, incoherent bunch of electrons and ended up with a series of fast, coherent microbunches. But we're not interested in the electrons themselves. All we care about are the X-rays that they emit. So, in the final stage, the electrons are rerouted and disposed of humanely while the light carries on to be used for experiments. <clears throat> Just to give you some context, uh, this animation is based on the free electron laser at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center in California, which is a staggering 3.2 kilometers long, but the whole journey takes only a hundred thousandth of a second.
Everything about these devices is on another scale. They consume the power of a small city and cost about a quarter of a billion pounds to run every year. But it's all worth it, we hope, because of the work that is done in the experimental hall, the final section of the FEL. Now that we've learned about the background of a standard XFEL, we can touch on its place in research. The largest constraint of using an XFEL is the time taken to analyse the data and the setup of the experiments. The actual data collection can take only around eight hours. In those eight hours, hundreds of thousands of diffraction images are taken over the length of the reaction, with each picture being of a random orientation of the reaction. The volume of data collected means it takes months on an advanced computer to compile our molecular movies. The first XFEL facility was Flash at DESI in Hamburg. It opened in 2005 and stood as the only facility with a short wavelength FEL across the globe for nearly five years. More advanced X-ray FELs have been constructed since. Two more XFELs facilities began operation in 2017 in South Korea and Germany, with a third following in 2018 in Switzerland. The one in Germany is called the European FEL. It used Flash as a prototype. Shown here is one of the first molecular movies compiled using the European FEL. It may seem rather uneventful, but it confirms the theorised potential of using FELs to explore molecular processes. Here are some resulting videos made from 3D imaging of a specific nanoparticle with an XFEL. This is one of several current studies using this technique. Other studies are looking at understanding molecular dynamics upon photo excitation and biological cell dynamics. This and the other videos you can see mark a point of achievement for FELs, which hope to inspire future research. I've only mentioned a few studies, but as the technology continues to develop, further areas of research are expected to emerge. FELs are expected to improve our currently limited knowledge of many biological processes. The progress in FEL research may be limited by the advancement of technology, but that won't stop scientists looking for answers to the age-old how question. With the, with the recent opening of numerous FEL facilities and others under construction, many research fields are expected to open up, while other fields may gain a new surge of interest in the coming years. The potential the FELs offer will truly come to shape how we view the world, how we learn its mysteries, and how we teach the next generation. Thank you for watching our video. We hope you enjoyed it and that you will be keeping your eye on FELs in the future.